Hey, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, new session of the Philosophy of Psychiatry uh, webinar. Um, so today we are uh, very pleased to welcome Aude Bandini. Uh, Aude Bandini is an assistant professor in epistemology at the University of Montreal. Uh, she has obtained an aggregation in philosophy and a PhD at the University of Aix-Marseille uh, One. Uh, her research interests uh, lie uh, in three uh, areas in particular. So the history of analytic philosophy and more particularly uh, American analytic philosophy, general epistemology, and more specifically the problem of uh, the foundation and justification of empirical beliefs and docastic ethics, and more precisely the problem of irrational beliefs. She has published uh, many papers, among others, uh, Les Racines du Donné, Le Débat pré salarien uh, in Les Études Philosophiques, uh, also uh, in 2018, l'irrationalité doxastique uh, in Revue philosophique de la France et de l'étranger, and more recently, uh, epistemic injustices and participatory research, a research agenda at the crossroads of university and community with uh, Baptiste Godry. Uh, so I'm now pleased to give the floor to Old Bandini for a talk entitled a Functional Neurological Disorder. It's in your head, but not quite. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, be here today and uh, I'm very grateful to Anne-Marie uh, and uh, um, okay, I'm having a, a functional uh, neurological disorder right now and a trouble with my memory. Uh, Anne-Marie and Sarah. Sarah, oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> That's stressed related. Okay, so um, I am not a philosopher uh, specialized in the philosophy of psychiatry, but I am developing right now uh, an interest in philosophy of medicine, uh, more globally speaking, uh, and especially my main focus is on the epistemic challenges that can be related to uh, the endeavor of uh, uh, reaching uh, some accurate diagnosis. So um, I'm going to just share my screen right now. So a few words uh, for uh, introduction and uh, context. So uh, hysteria, as you uh, probably know, uh, is a medical condition that has been appreciated for at least 3,000 years. And uh, although the name has changed over time from uh, hysteria to psychogenic uh, somatoform, psychogenic somatization and conversion, and nowadays functional neurological disorders, the clinical observable phenomena it captured has uh, remained globally the same. There is still a controversy, uh, controversy about the appropriate terminology though. In the DSM-5, uh, which uh, you have uh, right now on screen, this type of disorders uh, pertains to the diagnostic category of uh, somatic symptom and related disorders, along with, with illness, anxiety disorder, psychological factors affecting other medical conditions, factitious disorder, amongst others. So conversion disorders, uh, is actually the label that is used in the DSM-5, functional neurological symptom disorder appearing in brackets. The common feature of these disorders is, uh, as the DSM-5 puts it, quote, the prominence of somatic symptoms associated with significant distress and impairment. There has been a significant revision of uh, this defi definition, especially between DSM-4 and DSM-5, but that would be a topic uh, in and of itself, so I won't go into details uh, right here. While the DSM-5 insists that uh, the diagnosis uh, should be, uh, uh, quote, made on the basis of positive symptoms and signs, rather than the absence of a medical explanation for somatic symptoms, end of quote. And uh, though um, the DSM also warns that 
it is not appropriate to give an individual a mental disorder diagnosis solely because a medical cause cannot be demonstrated. It is acknowledged that medically unexplained symptoms remain a key feature in conversion disorder because it is possible to demonstrate definitively in such disorders that the symptoms are not consistent with uh, medical pathophysiology. The DSM-5 also emphasized that uh, individuals with conversion disorders are commonly encountered in primary care and other uh, medical settings, especially neurology clinics, but uh, that they are less commonly encountered in psychiatric and other mental health uh, settings. And this is because the, uh, the, the, the Asian essential feature of this set of disorders uh, is uh, neurologic symptoms motor-like uh, symptoms like weakness of, uh, or paralysis, abnormal movements like tremor, uh, gait abnormalities, sensory symptoms like paresthesia, dissociative symptoms like uh, depersonalization, derealization, seizures, and amnesia. So usually patients with FND will experience several symptoms, uh, some of them being prominent, but they can greatly vary uh, even over time for the same individual. They happen to be transient, but some of them become chronic. And yet, after appropriate neurological assessment, these symptoms are found to be incompatible with neurological pathophysiology. So FNDs can affect uh, also people of all ages, uh, including children, but less frequently than uh, middle-aged adults. And finally, they are two to three times more common in females. Importantly, the DSM-5 uh, mentions that, quote, individual with conversion symptoms may have substantial disability. The severity of disability can be similar to that experienced by individuals with comparable medical diseases, end of quote. So uh, FND is thus a condition at the interface of neuro neurology and psychiatry. And amongst ne neurologists, the label of functional neurological disorder is uh, usually preferred to uh, the label of conversion disorder or uh, psychogenic disorder because the later convey a reference to some kind of uh, an assumed etiology. It is common that uh, indeed patients with uh, FND have had experienced uh, stress or trauma, either psychological or uh, physical in nature, a short time before the, the symptoms uh, onset. So the DSM-5 acknowledges that, uh, quote, the diagnosis should not be withheld, if no trauma, no, tr no stress is found. But it is uh, generally assumed those symptoms to have a specific etiological relevance. Um, the, the, the psychological factors, sorry, are assumed to have a specific etiological relevance and um, stress and trauma are usually viewed as constituting a trigger for relapses and uh, chronicity. Um, Maladaptive uh, personality traits, uh, the presence of comorbid physical and psychiatric illness, and the receipt of uh, disability benefits are also viewed uh, as negative prognostic factors. So to some extent, the choice of uh, functional neurological disorder or FND over uh, psychogenic or conversion disorder, um, this uh, uh, choice and this preference reflects uh, some kind of an agnostic stance towards the uh, etiological relevance of psychological factors. And according to uh, Jon Stone, uh, which is one of the prominent specialists in the field uh, of uh, FND, on the neurology uh, side of the fence, and who was also an advisor for the DSM-5 uh, for um, the category of FND and some somatic symptom uh, and conversion disorder uh, for the DSM. Um, according to him, so according to Stone, um, 
both uh, FND and somatic symptom or conversion disorder are uh, trying to make sense of a common uh, disabling problem using positive diagnosis criteria, but they do so in such uh, radically different ways that they arguably should not be on the same uh, diagnostic axis of DSM. And he even goes as far as claiming that FND, like uh, functional gastrointestinal disorders, like uh, maybe the, 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 the the most famous would be ir irritable bowel uh, syndrome. Uh, so like uh, a pain medicine or a functional gastrointestinal disorders, uh, FND would be better off it, if it uh, had its own distinct uh, space separate both from mental disorders and somatic diseases, or maybe perhaps the other way around, uh, around uh, I quote Stone here, we should not have separate mental and disease classifications at all, and certainly not separate psychiatric and neurological ones. So in this presentation, I will not uh, discuss the relevance of or the accuracy of the DSM-5 uh, criteria, so, of course, uh, classification matters for both physicians and patients. Rather, I will focus on the epistemological challenges that uh, they face when they try to make sense of a condition uh, as perplexing and elusive as FND. So, um, in the uh, introduction uh, of our 2015 book, uh, All in Your Head, Making Sense of Pedrite pediatric pain, um, medical anthropologist uh, Mara Bushbinder distinguishes uh, four dimensions in biological uh, and biomedical explanation, namely cause, certainty, truth, and meaning. And arguably, uh, physicians are concerned with clinical causes abstractly viewed as relevant uh, stopping block in the chains of events that eventually leads to the disease or its signs and symptoms in an individual. And depending on the matters at hand, causes can be of different nature and come in different sizes and uh, colors. Uh, they can be genetic, infectious, developmental, and uh, environmental, and more often than not, uh, a mixture of several of the above. Pathophysiology is devoted to elucidating and disentangle the various events and processes that may be involved in the setting and development of illnesses, and sometimes it achieves this goal with reasonable success. Of course, the precise etiology of many health conditions remains unknown. But since at least the microbial revolution, there is one thing no one doubt, uh, there's a cause. And uh, it's, it is just being rational to investigate, uh, given uh, some clinical presentations uh, of sorts, what its cause may be, at least what is the element or circumstances without uh, the occurrence of which the disease would not occur as well. So that's just part of a good heuristic uh, in uh, research and understanding. In that uh, essential respect, FND is challenging since, as I mentioned earlier, one of its main characteristics is that it does not fit with any significant abnormality once thoroughly investigated. Tests uh, usually come back normal, and uh, neurologists as well as radiologists fail to single out any lesion, tissue damage, nor signs of any uh, ongoing pathological process. So uh, functional neurological disorders uh, then fall within the dreadful realm of uh, medically unexplained uh, symptoms. Of course, uh, unexplained <laughs> does not mean unexplainable. And in this specific context, as elsewhere in uh, scientific research, ignorance can actually be a trigger for new discoveries. And as uh, Stuart Fierenstein uh, compellingly argues, even uh, so-called known unknowns can be hard to elucidate. And in the case of uh, FND, 
there are some clinical and epidemiological data that can be useful, but the range and the diversity of symptoms make it already challenging to identify any clear pattern from intractable pain to seizures, headaches, blindness, paralysis, paresthesia, uh, speech or cognitive disorders, uh, the experienced and sometimes uh, observable presentation of FND strongly resist any unifying interpretation, except for some sort of pervasive brain dysfunction. Central uh, motor, cognitive and sensory systems are obviously altered. So one can assume that it, there is something going on with the brain, yet MRIs are clean, spinal taps show no sign of uh, inflammation, blood tests reveal no significant deficiencies and so forth. In other words, uh, no smoking gun. Worse, uh, symptoms can come and go. Sometimes they spontaneously uh, resolve, but sometimes they don't. They happen to change in intensity and nature over time. They may coexist with all the uh, illnesses. And for instance, patients living with epilepsy can and are even likely to experience uh, FND uh, under the form of non, uh, so-called non-epileptic seizure or uh, as uh, it is sometimes uh, uh, called um, pseudo seizures. So uh, as they um, persist, uh, these uh, symptoms can be significantly disabling and they may cause other conditions as well, like depression and uh, anxiety. So uh, let's stick to the brain uh, as it is so far the most reasonable target for investigation. People living with FND actually end up in uh, neurology clinics, but they also meet psychiatrists. And that's the uh, ambiguity, obviously, of a condition that is, uh, quote, in your head. And arguably, the lack of any identification uh, or identifiable neurological abnormality that could elicit such a range, a wide range of uh, experienced symptoms is good news. Uh, it means that as far as one can tell, there is no actual morbid process unfolding that could possibly be life-threatening. And as for the, the, the disorder's etiology, there remains another path to explore because not all somatic disorders have corresponding somatic cause. Some are rather so-called psychogenic. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, FND is defined in the DSM-5 amongst uh, the broader category of somatic symptoms and related disorders, along with uh, illness and anxiety disorder, psychological factors affecting other medical conditions and factitious disorder. So culturally, it goes without saying that attributing a psychogenetic origin to a set of symptoms that are bodily experienced sounds like a pejorative uh, value judgment rather than a neutral descriptive statement. It calls back bad memories of medical errancy and abuse, epileptic women uh, ostracized as uh, witches or uh, World War I uh, traumatized soldiers uh, treated like simulators who refused to return to fire and uh, who were uh, electrified accordingly. Now, if you have duly attended your Philosophy of Mind 101 class, though, uh, you uh, would know that mental causation is actually a thing. Uh, waving your hand can be appropriated, uh, appropriately explained by your desire to greet a friend. Likewise, feeling embarrassed may cause you to blush. So even though it is uh, not totally clear how emotions, uh, belief moods, or uh, expectations can precisely elicit bodily reactions, there are many situations in which they occur as perfectly uh, legitimate reasons, if not causes, in our daily explanations of one's behavior and one's bodily states as well. Tear and love, restlessness, 
uh, fidgets and the like. As people uh, living with uh, irritable uh, bowel syndrome know it too well, one states of uh, mind and external uh, psychological stressors can be of consequence. So what it is uh, about, um, what is it uh, about FND that would make it special and explain the prima facie resistance to its being characterized as a psychogenic condition? Well, we may think uh, of a few answers to this question. First, uh, the uncanniness of some of its symptoms and uh, disabling consequences. Some people uh, living with FND experience a garden variety of ailments, but whereas some of them are common in the general population, like uh, dizziness, heart racing, tingling, or headaches, Others are quite spectacular, like paralysis, seizures, or sudden blindness. It is reasonable to think that most people don't seek for medical attention and are even less so referred uh, by their GPs to second line specialists when they experience uh, only mild and transient uh, symptoms that they have already encountered and overcome. Uh, functional neurological disorders uh, can vary in nature and intensity, but often they are chronic. They hinder patients uh, functioning in their daily routine. They prevent them to go to school, to work, and they cause significant distress. And for that matter, they trigger a strong urge to seek for medical help. And in this respect, it is a uh, medical intervention and relief rather than a uh, compelling uh, uh, explanation that is uh, primarily hoped for. So the question, what is wrong with me, uh, is only instrumental with respect to the condition, to the question, how can we fix it? And at least from the patient's perspective, the quest for the disease uh, precise uh, etiology is generally only secondary. It makes its way to the forefront because of the patient's perhaps unrealistic uh, demand for a quick and easy uh, resolution. But uh, that hope uh, uh, remained unmet. Uh, it is healthcare providers' uh, failure to offer a ready to use intervention be it uh, pharmaceutical or otherwise, that prompts the need for explanation as the expectations regarding uh, physicians' expertise, authority, and uh, healing power are unfulfilled. Although arguably misplaced in the first place, uh, the naive faith in medical miracles is uh, shattered. And the issuing quest for an explanation is as much a request for information and facts than it is a request for justification and accountability. So here, folk representation of pathophysiology meets with experts' views. In many respects, they are at odds uh, one with the other. The pervasiveness of uncertainty in medicine is uncovered and sometimes it is painfully acknowledged by both protagonists. And given the magnitude of the manifest uh, effects, one expects or fear uh, a cause of somehow commensurate dimension with the effect, uh, 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 a cause that would be obvious, serious, threatening, and uh, quote, real. Here, um, the adjective will uh, generally means physical. Yet, uh, once again, physiologically speaking, that nothing of the sort shows up. The cause remains elusive. And it is either there, but invisible, because we don't yet have the technological means to detect it, just as the dark matter that is supposed to count for nearly 85% of the universe mass and energy, or it lies elsewhere in the obscure realm of uh, the human psyche. And interestingly uh, enough, 
medical investigation uh, goes both ways. And although the psychogenic hypothesis is still prevalent, clinical research in uh, neurology sustains hope in the ability of new imagery technology like functional uh, MRIs or the brand new uh, easelt uh, MRI uh, machine. Uh, now uh, the only patient that uh, this uh, uh, technology has been uh, investigating uh, is just a pupkin, but uh, if you are a pupkin with functional neurological disorder, actually, uh, maybe you can give it a try. So um, there are so the, the, the idea is that we have these hopes that a new technology uh, may help us to uncover whatever brain abnormalities uh, uh, could account for FND symptoms. Uh, some fascinating studies have been already conducted uh, that bring out allegedly evidence uh, of observable neurological differences. And uh, this is important, differences between patients actually and genuinely experiencing uh, FND and volunteers who were asked to fake FND-like symptoms. From uh, an epistemological point of view, this tells uh, much about what counts and what doesn't count in terms of evidence and explanation for both healthcare professionals, patients, and the public. So let's now turn to uh, the uh, epistemological uh, challenge uh, uh, raised by uh, FND. Because uh, FND pertains uh, to the more general category of medically unexplained symptoms, there is an extent to which the balance between uh, healthcare providers and patients is made less uneven epistemologically uh, speaking. Well, obviously, there is still a lot that the physician knows about the surroundings of the matter at hand that the patient doesn't. But the burden of uh, uncertainty and uh, ignorance is somehow shared uh, in a way uh, that it um, usually uh, the case when the condition is well documented. There is something puzzling uh, here, however, because uh, functional neurological disorders are very far from being a rare disease epidemiologically. As a consequence, the type of ignorance uh, we are dealing with is one of a kind. And uh, Stuart Ferenstein's work on ignorance in sciences will be helpful uh, here as it enables to see that uh, FNDs are probably not so much an object of learned ignorance as an object of poor interest. Yet it has not always been, and it is rather striking to see how much momentum research on FND has gained uh, about uh, the last, uh, in, in the last 15 years. However, um, clinicians specialized in, in FND, just like uh, in migraine or chronic pain, they regularly complain uh, that uh, functional neurological disorders are virtually never addressed in the med students' curriculum, at least in neurology. So, now, why would it be? Uh, the assumption here is that uh, as a psychogenic disorder, it belongs to the psychiatrist backyard. Things are a bit more complicated, though, because while psychological factors are undoubtedly a key element in the setting and development of FNDs, it recently turned out that they are not as crucial as they uh, were sought to be. For instance, according to current guidelines and diagnostic criteria, trauma is no longer considered a necessary condition for FND. Psy psychiatric disorders are arguably a risk factor, but so are recent uh, injuries, infections, and other pre-existing neurological disorders. Second, um, 
psychiatric comorbidities such as uh, health anxiety or depression can arguably be a result from rather than a contributing factor for uh, FND. Well, one might object that as a matter of fact, FNDs uh, have so far been classified in the DSM, but this is just begging the question, should they, if not for mere historic and contingent uh, reasons and uh, dubious assumptions concerning the mind-brain dualism and the types uh, of patients that uh, FND patients are. This issue cannot be ignored, especially by uh, clinicians caring for this class of patients for as uh, uncertain as they can be about the nature of this uh, disease or disorder, their professional responsibility is to deliver the most accurate diagnostic they can. This involves a double epistemic task. First, reaching a diagnosis um, that makes sense for them, or at least as much sense as uh, possible. And second, uh, delivering the diagnostic to their patient uh, and uh, do their best to ensure that uh, this diagnostic uh, also makes sense for them. And from an epistemological point of view, the clinical encounter can be appropriately construed as a game of uh, asking and giving for reason, uh, or giving and asking for reasons. Um, in the paradigm, especially of patient-centered healthcare, medical authority um, is held accountable for social and uh, institutional reasons. Physicians are granted with expertise and knowledge by default. But when challenged, uh, it is a matter of epistemic and uh, professional responsibility to be able to justify and uh, provide the reasons supporting their claims and uh, diagnostic conclusions. Um, the, the phrase I, I really don't know uh, is probably not the answer physicians uh, wish to utter, nor the patients to receive after they asked a question. But if sincere, uh, I really don't know is uh, an uh, epistemically appropriate answer in the context of the clinical encounter as anywhere else. Now, um, it is untrue that there is nothing that we know about FND. There are robust data uh, in epidemiology, clinical features, and prognosis. And even though is, its uh, etiology and mechanism remain unclear, explicative frames and uh, hypotheses are being developed and tested in accordance with the principles of uh, evidence-based medicine. But as scholars in the, the sciences studies uh, have highlighted a while ago, there are external factors that can hinder or at least harmfully curb the process of knowledge and understand, uh, understanding. And in the case of uh, functional neurological disorder, it is uh, worthwhile to investigate the non-epistemic factors that may contribute to uh, the perpetuation of so-called uh, undone science and the uh, insidious shift from the theoretically uh, medically unexplained illness to a much more definitive medically unexplainable illness. So in, in the field of agnotology, which is the, uh, the, the bundle of social sciences uh, who study uh, um, the, the phenomenon of ignorance, the, the phrase undone science refers to a situation of unequal power that is associated with absent knowledge. And uh, as uh, uh, someone like Hess uh, emphasizes, it does not uh, refer to all research that is recognized as not having been completed. Rather, it draws attention to a kind of non-knowledge or uh, nescience that is more or less systematically uh, produced and maintained, whereas at least some scientists and members of the public would see uh, knowledge in that field as positive or desirable to gain. 
are globally uh, political and social factors are playing a key role that I um, don't have um, the means nor the time to properly address today. But from uh, the time being, I shall focus on the much more proximate elements both physicians and uh, patients' testimonies allow me to single out. So for some time, uh, FND has been a diagnosis of exclusion. At least, uh, according to Jan Stone and uh, collaborators, for uh, functional neurological disorders, the opening statement uh, made by healthcare providers is often a negative one, something like, you don't have multiple sclerosis, which is often followed by some speculation on the etiology, partly because the etiology is uncertain and uh, multifactorial. This seems uh, relatively unique to functional neurological disorder since it amounts to some kind of um, an inversion of the order, uh, the order in which information is usually presented. For instance, if you think about uh, Parkinson's disease, an explanation would start with something like, you have Parkinson's uh, disease, followed up by an explanation of how that information is known and something about uh, the uh, mechanism. You don't, uh, it's a problem with the, the dopamine uh, in your brain and uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, in the case of FND, things uh, generally go differently. Um, here is what you don't have and uh, can reasonably be excluded. Now, this should not come as a surprise uh, since, uh, as uh, Cornel Gia and Kennedy uh, emphasized in a, a very nice paper about medically unexplained uh, symptom, um, symptoms, uh, quote, most diagnoses of a known cause are arrived at via the process of diagnosis by it's a part of the process of differential uh, diagnosis where a doctor will come up with a list of probable diagnoses. The doctor decides what to put in a differential by looking at pieces of positive evidence or evidence for a certain condition. Then when deciding what to exclude from a differential, a doctor might consider alternatives using negative evidence or evidence against certain conditions. Uh, end of quote. So needless to say, it is useful for healthcare providers facing a patients with uh, symptoms as those of FND to rule out uh, potentially life-threatening conditions like stroke or brain injury. But on the face of it, defining, defining a disorder in terms of what it isn't is not uh, really helpful nor uh, enlightening. And qualitative studies tend to suggest that a diagnosis by exclusion may serve um, several purposes. It is a way for uh, the physician to share where previous investigations have led so far for the sake of transparency and accountability. And it's just fine. But it also generally uh, means uh, to be reassuring for instance, uh, patients may hear, well, good news, it's not multiple uh, sclerosis or epilepsy, or even as the tests uh, come back normal, well, you know, there is nothing physically wrong with you. So on the one hand, um, the absence of any observable abnormalities uh, may appropriately give solace and lessen uh, the patient's anxiety. But on the other hand, uh, physician, physicians have uh, traditionally be, uh, been more worried to miss an organic diagnosis than a functional disorder, although the consequences for the patients are considerable in both situations. So admittedly, the absence of brain tissue lesions, inflammations, or infectious process uh, provide reasonable hope that the symptoms will eventually recede over time. But this is a bet on the future or on some sort of uh, this uh, mediatrix uh, naturae rather than uh, um, a genuine 
uh, prognosis. Now, according to the available data and retrospective cohort studies, uh, FND prognosis is not exactly good. Uh, in a, a, a 2016 chapter entitled Prognosis of Functional Neurological uh, Disorders, Gelauf uh, and uh, Stone notice, uh, and uh, that's a quote, uh, um, Views about prognosis of uh, FND uh, in the literature are markedly variable. Historically, the neurologist view has often wavered about uh, around optimism, mostly based on the conviction that symptoms that occur without any assignable pathology should disappear as quickly as they arise. This view has sometimes been confused with an overall treatment approach of some neurologists involving a feeling that they must reassure patients uh, that they will get better with the view that doing so will help that outcome to occur. And uh, based on two systematic reviews, uh, as well as additional studies, and despite several methodological issues that the authors really acknowledge, they conclude that uh, the prognosis of functional neurological disorders does appear to be generally unfavorable with variations depending on symptoms type. And overall, uh, symptoms remain the same or worse in the majority of patients. And this finding has been uh, very recently confirmed by another cohort study uh, in January to, <laughs> uh, 2022, actually. So uh, uh, in terms of uh, quality of life, general functioning and working uh, status as follow-up, the results are found to be uh, rather poor in many cases. And finally, uh, the most consistent negative prognostic is a long duration of symptoms. So it is of great importance to prevent symptoms from becoming uh, chronic, but how? Well, first, a suitable uh, diagnostic uh, should be offered, uh, meaning a positive and explanatory uh, diagnosis, despite the uh, uncertainty it may come with. And uh, as Cornoyea and Kennedy notice, uh, it puts an end to the investigation into the cause of the patient's uh, illness. It is both uh, pragmatically and medically desirable since some investigation procedures like spinal tap can be harmful, they are uh, costly, uh, they may be distressful and even uh, iatrogenic. And as the precision of medical imagery continue to improve, so are the risks of overdiagnosis. Second, as much as possible, a diagnosis of inclusion rather than of exclusion should be thought for. And of course, a positive and explanatory uh, diagnosing, uh, diagnosis being highly desirable for both healthcare providers and patients doesn't uh, in any way uh, make it easier uh, to achieve. Uh, that would be a bit of um, wishful thinking. However, there are barriers that can be overcome in order to get closer to that goal. And as I pointed uh, earlier, undone uh, science may remain undone for various reasons, but some of them are clearly alien to uh, the science uh, itself, sorry. <coughs> and uh, in this respect, the case of FND, uh, though not unique, is uh, special. Uh, for instance, um, surveys of a variety of health professionals uh, have demonstrated that negative views are commonly held about patients with uh, FND. A 2010 a study of the uh, so-called likability of uh, various neurologic disorders uh, among uh, 200 Texan neurologists, uh, they placed uh, psychogenic functional neurological disorders rock bottom in terms of uh, likability uh, and by uh, some distance in a list of uh, 20 disorders. 
uh, in a survey, uh, dislike ability was even rated as a useful diagnostic feature of a functional neurological disorder by 13% of uh, UK neurologists. So arguably, uh, patients uh, living with FND are difficult patients and the nature of uh, their symptoms may raise suspicion concerning their authenticity. Since uh, FND uh, uh, symptoms usually have the quality of voluntary movement, uh, healthcare providers uh, tend to question the extent to which those symptoms are conscious and whether the patient is or is not uh, genuinely experiencing uh, them. And uh, in a series of uh, in-depth interviews with 22 neurologists, uh, Richard Canaan and colleague uh, suggested that neurologists used the diagnosis of FND in a rather deceptive way because they were often agnostic about whether the patient was or was not feigning the symptoms. And um, John Stone and colleague on survey in 2003 among uh, um, 68 neuroscience nurses found similar rates of negative views and 16% uh, disagreed that FND were real, uh, 46 thought the patients were manipulative and 34 disagreed that a neuroscience unit was an appropriate place for the patients. Moreover, uh, FND symptoms are epidemiologically much more common in uh, women uh, around uh, three, four, one, and they have a peak between the ages of 35 and 50 years old. Uh, FND bears a large historical burden which connects it uh, directly to the infamous condition called hysteria and its notorious misogynistic uh, connotation. However, uh, one ought to refrain from jumping too hastily to conclusions and epistemically, uh, uh, and especially epistemic uh, wrongdoings and qualified attribution here. And uh, as Eleanor Byrne convincingly uh, argued in a 2020 paper uh, about uh, chronic fatigue symptoms, skepticism uh, over the reality of a diagnosis of medically unexplained illness amongst healthcare providers does not necessarily result from a negative stereotyping uh, of patient. Patients living with FND are certainly vulnerable to both testimonial and hermeneutical injustice, but questioning the meaning and accuracy uh, of uh, uh, a diagnosis and struggling to make sense of such um, uh, of such an uh, heterogeneous set of symptoms is quite a challenge. And in order to avoid um, negative stereotypes towards uh, healthcare providers, one should uh, not underestimate uh, the load of stress and anxiety that they also experience when. Uh, facing patients they feel unable to help or that they feel to harm, for instance, because they may have missed uh, something or make a uh, misdiagnosis. And due to lack of uh, proper uh, education, and especially when early in their career, several studies show that physicians can experience a great deal of difficult uh, emotions, including helplessness, frustration, powerlessness and professional uh, failure. And um, thanks to a meta-ethnographical uh, analysis, um, Johansson and Reiser conclude that negative experiences and emotions are commonly shared uh, between both general practitioners and patients with medically uh, unexplained uh, symptoms. So uh, interestingly, and it's, uh, that will be uh, my, my last pon point here. Um, the same studies confirm that uh, patients also may tend to regard their problems as uh, organic, uh, whereas physicians uh, tend to see them as having social or psychological causes. 
Thus, they hold uh, incongruent uh, uh, theoretical models of the disease process. And patients are uh, especially generally reluctant uh, when the possibility of a non-organic and at least partially uh, psychogenic uh, condition is raised. Uh, and when they discover that uh, functional neurological disorder um, is uh, actually a psychiatric uh, a psychiatric diagnosis. So um, in the case of FND, uh, we are dealing with uh, some kind of uh, feel-good uh, history because uh, there have been significant progress uh, made in the elucidation of positive feature uh, supporting uh, a, a genuine and more satisfying diagnosis. But we should uh, keep in mind that uh, the search for uh, positive signs is still a work in progress for other so-called contested illness, uh, and especially right now as we are facing um, the mystery of uh, so-called long uh, or chronic COVID as uh, uh, the same has been uh, done uh, by uh, Abigail Dumps about uh, Lyme or chronic Lyme disease. So thank you. Thank you very much, Aude Banzini. Thank you. Um, so yeah. Now we are going to have time for questions and um, in order to do that, um, if you have a question, can you write in the chat question or I have a question or something so we can um, see the, the order of questions. Um, I'll, uh, I'll start to, to break the ice. That, that happens <laughs> sometimes that we need a few minutes. So um, uh, thank you for your talk. A very, very interesting topic. And I, um, I am wondering actually if we go through um, like a diagnosis through, through exclusion. So we, um, it's not a positive one, but a negative one, meaning we uh, have to exclude a lot of things before telling the patient, okay, this is FND. Like when does that happen and how does that happen? Um, is it a question of, of time? Because we cannot exclude everything, right? So, so concretely, I have a hard time understanding exactly how can we actually ever give that diagnosis? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a fair point. Um, actually, um, that that's really uh, that lies at at the the heart of the matter. Um, diagnosing uh, something like a medical unexplained uh, illness or symptoms. Uh, is barely an, uh, a diagnosis and uh, it has no um, explaining power nor uh, uh, epistemic uh, uh, force by any standard. So it's a kind of um, <laughs> best of the words. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the 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 best of words worst uh, uh, possibilities that you can uh, that you can uh, achieve. My suspicion is that there is another emphasis in uh, what counts as a serious medical illness and a less serious one, especially coming from neurologists. And since uh, well, it seems that uh, the brain and the uh, uh, central nervous system is uh, working appropriately. Well, uh, it doesn't fall in my backyard. Uh, I'm not trained for that. And uh, more or less uh, directly, this is not my, my problem. Go and uh, seek for counseling or uh, a psychiatrist and, uh, and so forth. But um, we can also uh, um, 
access and uh, um, appreciate uh, how difficult it might be for a physician to give a diagnosis when any uh, physiological cause is uh, identifiable. Hence, the suspicion of uh, factitious uh, disorder, for, for instance. Now, the, the, the studies, uh, uh, I think, um, fairly prove that uh, most of uh, neurologists take the patient's distress seriously, but they are just facing their own ignorance, and that's distressful, and there is a sense of failure and a sense of inadequacy. So, uh, and the referral to other specialists, especially in uh, mental health. All right, thank you. Thanks, yeah, that, that helps. Um, next question from Miriam Solomon. I enjoyed your talk. Um, I, I couldn't help wondering how much the history of hysteria in particular as a women's condition that um, Freud focused on is still affecting both the diagnosis and the treatment of, of this disease. So you mentioned in passing, it's two to three times as many women as men um, have this diagnosis. I wonder whether there's been any reflection on um, whether there's any gender bias in the in the giving of the diagnosis. And um, uh, I guess the 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 everyone knows that it was called hysteria at one point, and that Freud offered a model of how to bring repressed conflicts to consciousness. And I don't know that there's any other model out there. Yeah, yes, thank you. You're absolutely right. Um, obviously, there are uh, prejudices at play and uh, gender biases. And uh, um, someone like uh, John Stone and uh, his uh, colleagues um, put a great deal of effort to um, some, for instance, uh, 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 recall that uh, multiple sclerosis is also uh, a third times more frequent in uh, women uh, than in men. So it's not something specific to uh, functional neurological disorder. And, but the, 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 this willingness to uh, distance from the Freudian uh, model uh, is, uh, um, is observable and manifest in their um, insistence uh, on the label functional neurological disorder rather than conversion disorder, and for that matter, hysteria, because it has a, a huge load of you know, uh, disputable uh, history and, uh, and um, diminishing and uh, demeaning uh, also that, well, uh, functional neurological disorders can also Uh, My proportions. I think you cut, Ode. I don't know if you, if oh. it's for connection, but uh, we lost a, just a little bit of your answer at the end. Like, if you can just maybe repeat, okay. like, just thirty seconds back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, that that was. Uh, I'm very sorry. That was the the most interesting part of anything that I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> in answering uh, um, Miriam's uh, uh, question. Uh, the, the idea is just that um, um, prominent uh, specialists in uh, FND now like to uh, use the term uh, FND rather than uh, conversion or uh, hysteria <laughs> disorder because uh, it comes with a lot of a great deal of uh, uh, um, misogynistic connotation. And um, historically, um, there is a better work uh, Stone uh, maintains in, for instance, Charcot, 
or Brickett's work in the 90th century um, that, that were uh, better and much less uh, gender biased than uh, Freud's uh, uh, work were. So there is something like, th there has been uh, strictly a kind of eclipse of functional neurological disorders for a while. And now it feels like, well, Charcot was, was right. <laughs> Actually, and he he took um, obviously uh, the the those disorder much more seriously than uh, um, resorting to the abuse, uh, sexual and uh, misogynistic uh, explanations. Thank you. So, next question is from Diane O'Leary. Hi. Um, thanks so much for that talk. Um, I. I'm going to follow up a bit on some things Marianne was saying. I'm wondering, um, I'm surprised to hear, you know, this is my area, so I, I'm surprised to hear that um, there's no skepticism in, in your work about whether FND is actually, actually a genuine diagnosis, whether it's a real disorder, a substantive coherent construct at all. Um, it seems like we have really good reasons for uh, at least wondering about that, um, particularly given the long history of misogyny and um, uh, sexism um, in the history of hysteria. So I'm seeing um, basically uh, three reasons for doubt there. Uh, one would be that um, the construct was basically invented by um, Michael Sharp and Alan Carson in 2001 in a paper where they uh, explained that patients don't comply with treatment for conversion disorder because they expect to have a biological disease. So if you tell them they have a biological disease, a brain disease, then they will be happy and they will comply. So there's this deep deceptive origin to the construct that then became FND by the people who now do the primary research on FND. Um, but in addition to that, you know, we don't have any consistent brain pathology, any consistent psychological symptoms or behavioral symptoms, uh, and the treatment generally doesn't work. Um, the treatment is not effective. So um, given that there are so many medical conditions uh, particularly women's diseases that have been mistakenly attributed to their psyches, MS, lupus, endometriosis, um, MECFS now has shifted over from psychological to a uh, biological disease. And of course, uh, long COVID. Um, I wonder if maybe this construct does a lot more harm than good. Yeah, thank you. Um... So yeah, uh, uh, you're definitely uh, right to raise a, a suspicion about um, the actual explanatory or even accuracy of FND as a diagnosis. Uh, what I find uh, interesting, for instance, in uh, uh, John's uh, uh, work is that um, he, he has uh, assessed uh, at follow-up, uh, how much uh, the FND diagnosis is reversed or uh, finally turned out uh, to be a misdiagnosis. And actually, uh, FND uh, diagnosis turned out to be uh, misplaced uh, less frequently than, for instance, multiple sclerosis. So that's, that's an that's not a proof that it's an accurate diagnosis, but that's still uh, one uh, element. And has the um, there are several things that are interesting in your in your question, and uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to address every one of uh, those. But um, in a nutshell, uh, the quest for uh, positive uh, signs 
for reaching the diagnosis like the Hoover signs and the distraction uh, leading patients uh, feeling that they have weakness or they have a tremor and they stop having them when their attention is distracted otherwise uh, are usually uh, used as positive signs that there is nothing psychologically uh, 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 wrong, uh, 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 physiologically wrong with the patients, but there, there, there is this kind of mismatch uh, between the functional and the structural uh, um, uh, level of the brain. So uh, those other, uh, as you uh, of course know, they use this metaphor of the uh, software versus hardware. Uh, uh, of, of, the, of the brain. I don't know to what extent uh, it is accurate, uh, but in terms of uh, meaningfulness and in terms of uh, giving patients um, a kind of hint and relief, it doesn't seem to be so bad. And as for the um, efficiency of treatment, um, well, there is uh, arguably a kind of placebo effect linked to the, the speech act of having a diagnosis and uh, putting a name on the illness. So, of course, it's not sufficient by any standards to uh, give relief, but at least in terms of um, compliance for the patients, uh, and uh, as far as the uh, trust in the relationship with their healthcare providers is uh, concerned, it seems to 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 be a, a good prognostic factor. But uh, it's it's just the the beginning of the story. I, I totally agree, and there are much more work to be done. So thank you. All right, there is a question in the chat and the question is in French. So um, just for the uh, net non-francophones here, I'll, I'll try to translate. Um, so could FND be a temporary category, um, another one to, in, like, to reduce the non-specified psychiatric diagnosis in order to um, increase the scientific credibility of psychiatry? Uh, and you can see the question in French, yeah. if it makes more sense. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I, I'm just uh, watching it right. right now, but I'm not sure that I uh, understand uh, the... Like, could, could I, I, so from what question. I understand, the question is um, to, to know if it could be maybe a kind of category that is put there temporarily um, to... To give a sense that psychiatry um, is like is credible or uh, something like that, because of all these uh, non-specified um, uh, syndromes in the DSM, maybe to remove like some of them and instead have something that is a positive category instead of having like all these non-specified things that we don't like. Mm -hmm. um, so that would that would make psychiatry like have a better legitimacy or something like that because we have a diagnosis instead of none or instead of a non-specified one i yeah, suppose right. that's the question but I, yeah, i'm not sure okay um I, I i'll i'll i think that um the 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 category of medically unexplained uh, symptoms uh and this is something that michael cornelia uh emphasized in his uh paper, uh, medically uh, unexplained symptoms is just a place, a placeholder with the hope that eventually we will come up with something like a causal uh, and a pathophysiological uh, etiology that would be respectable. But uh, it comes with a, a, some kind of very dualistic uh, view and a reductionist view of psychiatry and uh, even neurology uh, for uh, that uh, matter. So uh, what's interesting, and um, uh, that's uh, in, in one of uh, the, the, the earlier questions that the point was raised, uh, patients 
much more than healthcare providers are asking for a bodily uh, answer and a bodily cause. And they are greatly dissatisfied when such a cause is not provided. Whereas usually, uh, at least uh, uh, now, uh, physicians are trained uh, uh, to use the psycho, social, biological uh, models. So they are very much uh, more comfortable with the idea of suggesting that, well, maybe social factors and psychological uh, factors can be uh, uh, triggers or uh, a cause or something like that. It's really a certain uh, representation in the public uh, of what is a real illness and what is not. And sometimes, of course, it's uh, obviously shared by some physicians as well. But uh, we know uh, how much uh, psychiatry can have a, a bad reputation uh, amongst uh, some physicians, uh, and uh, they would uh, be eager to reduce it to uh, uh, neurology. But uh, um, in the case of FND, uh, things uh, seem to be a bit uh, resistant to uh, this kind of uh, reduxism. Great, thanks. Uh, Anne-Marie, you are the next one. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Aude, for, uh, for this great talk. Uh, I have, I think I follow up on uh, Marie-Noël questions, but it was more about, so you you talked about it a, a little bit, but I was just wondering if you have any like clear ideas about why it has been included in the in DSM-5, given this absence of or lack of clear knowledge, especially because like there's been all this, I guess, motivation or goals or, or more uh, of more uh, validity in DSM-5. Of course, there are <laughs> it's not clear that we, we have achieved that, but I mean, it, it there was this big motivation and this specific diagnosis doesn't seem to <laughs> to match the new standards of validator in DSM-5. So I was just wondering you if you have, if we have access to like the rational be behind uh, FND being in the DSM-5 more specifically. Yeah, th th there has been uh, 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 quite a literature, um, especially concerning uh, the, the differences lying between uh, the def definition of FND in uh, DSM-4 to uh, its definition and criteria in, the, in DSM-5. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as uh, Miriam uh, uh, earlier uh, mentioned, uh, if functional neurological disorders uh, are appearing in the DSM, it's for uh, rather historical and uh, perhaps uh, um, contingent uh, reasons, that is, absent cause, and that's an argument from ignorance. If it doesn't come from the body, it must come from whatever it is that would you would in the the, um, the mind. Um, uh, and as I uh, uh, emphasized uh, earlier, uh, there are questions about whether uh, actually FND. Uh, really pertain to the DSM or whether they should be acknowledged by uh, and amongst other uh, conditions and disease. The, the, even the term uh, disorders, uh, FNDs are usually viewed as an illness, meaning experienced as bad health uh, or ill health by patients, but not a disease because the term disease refers to, you know, actual, uh, actual um, uh, 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 symptoms and signs and so forth. And for instance, in um, Abigail Jooms' uh, work, uh, that's an ethnographic work on uh, so-called chronic Lyme uh, disease, um, it's pretty interesting how the diagnosis uh, of such a condition is contested and whether like, you know, that there has been uh, all this uh, 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 noise about the so-called Havana symptoms uh, and Havana syndrome and uh, uh, people in the embassies in Cuba experiencing symptoms and, and et cetera. And 
the question is whether uh, there has been a kind of attack by the Russians or whatever it is, um, or the, the Chinese uh, on uh, US embassies uh, representant, or if it was just a kind of mass hysteria. But of course, the term mass hysteria is so loaded in terms of values that, uh, and, and patients uh, argue that I, I, I'm not crazy. <laughs> So I don't know where, to what extent I uh, uh, I, I answered to to your question though. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Next question is from Jenny Ship. Hi. Yeah. Thank you so much for for giving this talk on such an important theme. Um, uh, oh, two uh, questions. First, um, I wanted to go back to your. Uh, your distinction in with the what is wrong with me and the how we can fix up these two questions and just a little bit of pushback on kind of the secondary uh, nature of that first question. I think um, for a lot of these patients, whether they're formally or not formally given this diagnosis or diagnoses that might be arguably similar, I think that um, it's very much important to understand what is actually wrong with them. This is something that they are kind of living with day to day, minute to minute and becomes, you know, it can be really all consuming. And so I think there's a real value in kind of this desire to understand kind of what, what is wrong with them almost insofar as it becomes kind of part of their identity. So, and to some extent that, you know, especially if these are chronic conditions because ultimately I, I agree with, I think, uh, Diana O'Leary, there, there might not really be one thing here. There could be multiple things here. You know, to the extent that th some of these might genuinely be chronic, you know, there, maybe there is no real treatment or maybe some kind of a, something they can do to manage their symptoms. But to understand what really is going on, I think could actually be in some ways, maybe, but, you know, not just helpful, but could actually be kind of medically uh, beneficial to understand what's really going on. Uh, and then the second thing is, uh, you know, this has come up a lot with the, with the long COVID discussions, but you know, there's kind of like a neighboring uh, disease entity called POTS, which is the, the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which, uh, you know, you could do all these tests in the world, MRI, uh, blood tests, all these different things, and they'll come back normal. Um, so in many ways, you kind of get, you would think that this entity matches up with what you've said. And, uh, but the reality is if you just check, you know, the patient's heart rate lying down versus standing, you'll understand at least to some extent what's wrong with them. So this is like yet another one of these examples that kind of historically has been, you know, psychologized and a lot of neurologists just assumed it was kind of a psychological disorder, but slowly it's kind of been understood to have a real kind of physical cause. But of course, that doesn't mean that it's completely understood at all. It's, it's one of these kind of neurological disorders that is very, you know, there are lots of different theories about genuinely what's causing it, but it's, you know, just, just to say that, you know, at the end of the day, when you get to this kind of picture of all the tests are coming back normal, there isn't really one thing that's going to push you from the left or the right to say, well, okay, this is uh, psychosomatic, or this is something that we don't yet know what it is, but if we had the right tests, we could figure it out. So yeah, just two, two thoughts. Curious if you have any. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. What maybe I should have been, uh, uh clearer about my uh, intentions here. I, I am thinking within a kind of um, holistic uh, conceptual frame, uh, but uh, uh, holistic in, in, the, in, in, in the philosophy of science, uh, uh, um, a sense of the, the term in, in the Quinean uh, uh, frame, which is, OK, so obviously, our theories are uh, underdetermined by experience. And what happens when your uh, theory uh, and your 
uh, is uh, is confronted or disconfirmed by an experience, namely my uh, neurology uh, uh, framework uh, is at odds with the presentation of functional neurological disorders. So my my question is: in the face of ignorance. Uh, uh, of this time and un uncertainty, what is rational to do? So there are a lot of things that you can do. You can uh, question the, the experience, that is, question the testimony of the patients, and uh, well, maybe suggest that they they could be feigning the symptoms. That's one possibility. Uh, I'm not sure that it is the right one, but that's something that you cannot uh, exclude. Uh, you can uh, revise your uh, most fundamental assumptions about, um, let's say, the, the, the difference between uh, the brain and the mind, and you can make, uh, if you are familiar with David Chalmers' uh, philosophy of mind, you, you, can, you can do that as well. And then you can uh, kind of uh, uh, work with your uh, bridge uh, assumption and laws uh, um, in between. And uh, what I was trying to uh, um, uh, uh, investigate, but once again, it's really the early stage of, uh, of this project, is how some narratives can be uh, pragmatically uh, relevant and uh, therapeutically uh, helpful as well. And in the case of the um, distinction and, and the, the computer metaphor, and this uh, distinction between, well, you have a software problem, you don't have a hardware problem. And sometimes, and you, uh, in the studies about uh, chronic pain, you have this idea of sensitization as well, just as if once you've experienced pain, for some reasons, your pain uh, system is going uh, whack and you still feel pain when there is no longer any tissue damage and blah, blah, blah. So um, as uh, Diane uh, was uh, uh, suggesting, that could be used in a deceptive way, but you have to be pragmatic, uh, uh, I guess, uh, and help the patient as far as you, uh, as, as you can. Um, since, hermeneutically and uh, from an uh, interpretative uh, uh, point of view, it makes sense for both patients and physicians. Why shouldn't we uh, resort to it for the time being? Uh, and uh, it's, it's revisable. I mean, it's a, I guess that it's all uh, um, occurring in the general frame of uh, fiabilism. And once we have uh, 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 achieved a more satisfactory explanation, then we could get rid of the FND category and uh, uh, underlying causal explanation. OK, we have two more questions. So if we go pretty fast, we can maybe uh, take them both. Uh, Julieta Moore? Yeah, hi, hi. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I apologize in advance for my English. So uh, so I study chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, especially I'm interested in the doctor-patient relationship in situations of medical uncertainty. And well, there are a lot of similarities with FNDs, of course. Uh, I guess uh, in response to what uh, Miriam was saying, uh, I, I, or Diane, I guess, uh, that the uncertainty, uh, of course, affects the, the construct of <laughs> the construction of the diagnosis, of course. So we are all asking uh, each other if what is chronic fatigue syndrome? Is it only one thing or is, is a, a lot of or multi, multiple entities, actually? And in relation with what you said, you were talking about the um, biopsychosocial uh, model of, of disease. And I'm interested in the theory of the central sensitivity syndromes that you just <laughs> talked about. And in this, in this theory, they like incorporate like almost 50 entities 
that uh, what they have in common is that they're like uh, medically unexplained and that they affect mostly women. <laughs> so, and this theory is really interesting because uh, it's like, um, um, I, I, I guess it's kind of like a neophemism because uh, they say like, um, there's a central senti sensitization or sensitivity that is um, con uh, where estrogens contribute to this uh, sensitivity. So I guess, uh, it's supposed to be more like a biolo biologist uh, expl expl explanation, but I think it's actually an euphemism of uh, psychosomatic uh, disorder. So the, the real problem there, uh, and what my question goes to is like, uh, the, the problem is how to address that uh, epistemic challenge and the question about the mind and body. And I wonder how, how you, how did you ask, address that question? And um, mostly uh, also because uh, in the social science and in anthropology, uh, where I come from, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of criticism to uh, biomedical bi biologists, biologicism, I don't know if I'm saying it right. So uh, how do we transcend <laughs> that uh, question uh, in our, our, our disciplines, our, for example, in the social science? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. So <laughs> I'm uh, an advocate of uh, epistemic pluralism. Uh, so so, so I, I would not uh, take a stand and neither do I think that I uh, need to have a precise stand about the issue of uh, the mind and body dualism? And uh, I think that for most of physicians, uh, for most of uh, uh, healthcare providers, uh, the mind and body uh, dualism, while still uh, present, is not really a, a, a conceptual frame that is uh, believed in or relied uh, on. I guess that a lot of, most of people, including uh, uh, healthcare providers, uh, agree that there are obvious interactions between your mental states and your bodily states and the way uh, around. And um, the, the, from what I understood, um, and that's how because I I, I'm, I keep thinking about the Diane uh, question. It seems to me that the goal of the treatment in, in FND is to avoid um, chronicity of the symptom and the the kind of catastrophe process that may. Uh, ensue from the prior onset of the symptoms. So for example, uh, patients with FND will be referred to physiotherapy in order to, as much as possible, conserve their functionality and uh, or they will be referred for um, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, when they experience um, non-epileptic seizures. Uh, in order to uh, manage uh, the, the, the attacks when they arrive without freaking out and uh, making things worse or developing uh, um, health anxiety uh, disorders on top of their FND. So, of course, once more, it doesn't solve the problem of uh, uh, FND uh, itself, but at least it prevents things for uh, getting. Uh, even worse in that matter. So it's a very uh, humble position. And uh, well, there, there will still uh, a lot of work to do. And in, in that respect, uh, all of the, the work that is currently done in the social sciences, uh, I mentioned uh, Mara Bushbinder about pain, uh, uh, making sense pain, uh, of uh, pediatric pain, for, for example. Um, a lot of what is happening in the social sciences is relevant for, you know, somehow overcoming the 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 the, the, the challenge of so-called medically uh, unexplained illnesses. So keep 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 working on it. <laughs>
Thank you. I think we're Thank out you. of time, unfortunately. So uh, we had a question from Samuel Montplaisir. I invite you to write to Aude Bandini um, and uh, anyone else who, who wants to, to follow up on that, if, if that's okay, Aude. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for being here. And uh, thank you, Aude Bandini, for uh, this talk. I remind you that uh, the next session is on February 24th, and we will welcome Kengo Miyazono uh, for a talk entitled Group Delusion and Folia 2. So we hope, hope to see you um, there in two weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.